Well, hey there, and welcome back to Heimler's History. Now, we've been going through Unit 5 of the AP Government Curriculum, and in this video, it's time to talk about political parties. So if you're ready to get them brain cows milked linkage style, well, then let's get to it. So in this video, we're going to try to do two things. Describe linkage institutions and explain the function and impact of political parties on the electorate and government. So let's begin by talking about linkage institutions. A linkage institution is a societal structure that connects people to their government or the political process. We often talk about how here in America, we have a government by the people and for the people. But in case you haven't noticed, American citizens aren't jacked into the matrix so that their political preferences are downloaded directly into a giant political mainframe. Although maybe that would increase voter turnout. No, it's a terrible idea. Anyway, short of straight download from our brains, how do our elected officials know what we want? How is it that we communicate with them and tell them, pass this law, but don't pass that one? Well, the answer is that we need mechanisms between us and our elected officials through which we can communicate with them, and those are called linkage institutions. These are structures that act as intermediaries between average people like you and me with the policymakers in the federal, state, and local government. Now, there are four linkage institutions that you need to know. Political parties, interest groups, elections, and media. Each of these linkage institutions exists to allow we the people to communicate our preferences to policymakers. And since each of those are going to have its own video here in Unit 5, I'm only going to focus in this video on political parties as linkage institutions. So, what is a political party? Well, it's pretty simple. A political party is an organization at least partially defined by a certain ideological belief that puts forward candidates for election. Now, in previous videos, I covered the two major political parties in America and their ideological leanings, so here I'm just going to summarize. The Democratic Party represents the more liberal ideology, while the Republican Party represents a more conservative ideology. But whatever ideology each party holds to, the main goal for each party is to put forward candidates who will win elections. Now, parties play a significant role in which candidates run for office and in the drawing of legislative districts, which ultimately benefit the candidates of the party. And look, the truth is, anyone could run for office without the back of a party, but as my southern brethren and sistren are fond of saying, they're usually about as successful as a one-legged man in a butt-kicking contest. Okay, so let's talk about what parties actually do. One of their first priorities is the mobilization and education of voters. The biggest goal any political party has, of course, is to win elections, and that means they have to expend a great deal of energy to get their party members and others who are sympathetic to their platform to the voting booth. To this end, they can hold voter registration drives and even drive voters to the polls who cannot otherwise drive themselves. And they do that by calling, emailing, testing, or showing up at people's doors and encouraging them to vote and educating them on their candidates' desirability. Now, during election seasons, parties organize huge canvassing campaigns. This is when a huge army of party volunteers calls people or shows up at people's homes with the goal of persuading people to vote for their candidate. If you've ever seen people with signs in their front yards endorsing a candidate, chances are that's a result of party canvassing efforts. The second thing parties do is write and publish a party platform. This is a formal set of principles and policy goals written and endorsed by the party. In other words, the party platform lists the kind of policies the party will enact if their candidate is elected. Now, if you read the platform of the Democratic Party, you're going to see lots of policies that reflect liberal ideology, like universal health care, rights for marginalized groups, and significant environmental regulations. If you read the platform for the Republican Party, you're going to see lots of policies that reflect conservative ideology, like an America first foreign policy, traditional family values, and the deregulation of business. So the platform is the party essentially saying, like, if this is the kind of America you want, then elect our candidates, and we'll make it happen. Third, if parties are going to win elections and implement their platform, then they need candidates who can win, and parties expend a great deal of energy finding quality candidates. The ideal candidate for any party has a few characteristics. First, a good candidate is likable. Like, you know, nobody wants to elect a turd, so this is key. And, you know, likable is very subjective. In 2016, Donald Trump polarized Americans with his brash talk, especially around issues that were culturally taboo, like immigration and race. However, there was clearly a large segment of the American population who found those qualities very likable. Second, a good candidate already has a significant following. Now, a good following doesn't always equal the best candidate. For example, Abraham Lincoln was relatively unknown when he got the Republican nomination, and you know, I'd say he was a pretty decent president. And that leads me to the third qualification for a good candidate, namely that they can unite different segments of the party, and that is why Abraham Lincoln ultimately earned the nomination. He was able to unite the Northern Democrats and the remainder of the Whig Party and several other factions. And the fourth qualification for a good candidate is, ideally, money. As we'll see later in this unit, it's usually a metric buttload of hooch that wins elections, not ideally. Idealism. And so a good candidate should be able to raise a bunch of money. Okay, now back to what parties do. The fourth thing that parties do is to provide campaign management support for their candidates. Parties try to get their candidate elected by hosting fundraisers and implementing targeted media strategies that are going to appeal to most voters. And the party which does this best? 
usually win. So after all of that explanation, hopefully you can see how a political party acts as a linkage institution, connecting average people like us to the political process. Like if you alone wanted to run a political campaign, you don't have that kind of money, you don't have the army of volunteers, you don't have the infrastructure to make that happen, but a party does, and so if you register with that party or even just align yourself with it, then the party links you to the political process. Okay, let me just say one last thing. Everything I've said so far about the influence of parties has been about the process before and during the election. But after a party's candidate is elected, the party continues to play a significant role. If you remember all the way back to Unit 2 when we talked about Congress, you'll remember that a politician's party membership determines committee chairs, supposing that they're in the majority party, and leadership roles in the legislature, roles like Speaker of the House and Senate Majority and Minority Leaders. So the point is, political parties play a significant role in linking average Americans to the political process. Okay, thanks for watching. Click right here if you want to grab my review packet, which is going to help you get an A in your class and a 5 on your exam in May. If this video helps you and you want me to keep making them, then by all means, subscribe and I shall oblige. Heimler out.